Good evening, everyone. I'm Robin Everett. I work for the State Archives. Thank you for coming. Okay. Good evening, everyone. I'm Robin Everett. I work for the State Archives. We have Susie doing technical support this evening. We also have Gillette doing technical support up there. We're to be partnering with the Rock Pile. Museum at Gillette. Till the end, Justin will monitor questions in Gillette. We will monitor questions here. For those of you watching the yeah. Eventbrite, YouTube, and Facebook, please post your questions in the comments section. They will be able to speak. Tonight, Justin Horn is going to speak of his research on the murder of Allie Beans and some early Gillette history. Justin grew up in Buffalo, Wyoming. He attended the University of Wyoming, earning a BA in history. He also holds an MA in history from the University of Nebraska, Germany, and a master certificate in museum studies from Harvard's Extension School. As a historical interpreter, he has worked seasonally for the National Park Service at the historic site. Justin also served as in the U.S. Air Force as a job and was lucky enough to travel extensively during his six-year enlistment. He currently lives in Gillette and works as a museum assistant in collections and exhibits in the Rock Pile Museum. He loves the Big Water Mountains and the Black Hills and is great for the recreational opportunities they provide. I'm going to turn it over to Justin. All right, thank you, Robin and Cheyenne, for that introduction. It was a little, um, broke up a little bit on our end. So for those of you who aren't aware, we're trying something new, and we're simultaneously broadcasting to a live audience at the State Archives in Cheyenne. So we're kind of pushing the technological envelope right now. We're trying something new. So thank you for all coming out to the Murder of Alley Means. My name is Justin Horn, museum assistant here at the Rock Pile Museum. And so tonight, again, looking at the murder of Ali Means, so I just want to um, give a shout out to the State Archives. This is part of their evening speaker series that they do every second Thursday of the month. So next month, they've got one on South Pass City, and then in June, uh, one with, uh, they're partnering with our friends over in Buffalo to do one on Wyoming photography. So again, check out the Wyoming State Archives for um, their evening speaker series. 
Um, here at the Rock Pile Museum, we've got our own full slate of events. It's our 50th anniversary, so we're going all out. Uh, next week, same time, same place, we're having Paul Horstead come talk about his book, Exploring with Custer. Uh, we've got him in the gift shop, shameless plug. So we're going to see some uh, historic photography compared with modern day images tonight. So if you're into that sort of thing, that's kind of what Paul Horstead does. And he's going to be talking about the 1874 Custer Expedition of the Black Hills. And it's the 150th anniversary of that major historical event. Um, and the next month here at the Rock Pile, we got our big sheep herders festival coming up, which Heather's been working hard on to get going. So that should be quite the event and a whole slate of things this summer. So take a brochure that we've got around uh, about all of the events this summer. But tonight we are talking about the murder of Allie Means. So Allie Means has been shot. He soon died of his wounds. He committed by Noah Richardson, cold blood and murder. Well, it's right there in the front page of the newspaper. So not much of a murder mystery. So mystery solved. Thank you for coming out. Hope you have a good evening. See you next week for Paul Horston. All right. So obviously you've got some questions such as who was Ali Means? Who was Noah Richardson? Why did Richardson shoot Means? We're having more technological issues. Why did Richardson shoot Means? Maybe. All right, anyway. <laughs> the eagle eyed among you might wonder why the heck I cropped the newspaper headline like I did. So we got some questions to answer tonight. But first, we're going back in time. I may not have a time machine, but I've got a museum, which is the next best thing. So we're going to take a trip back in time to 1905 Gillette, Wyoming. It's been said that the past is a foreign country, so we can look at this as if we're going traveling. So 1905, Gillette looked quite a bit different than it does today. So this photo, for those of you down in Cheyenne or watching online, not as familiar with Gillette, we're looking down Gillette Avenue. We're looking south, uh, southeastward, Gillette Avenue, the main street runs north-south, and we are standing on, in the 1905 image, what was known as South Railroad Street, or today we call it First Street. Those names got changed. And the important thing, though, is that the railroad tracks are behind the photographer. So in 1905, you stepped off the train. This is pretty much what you'd be seeing. And we can see in the 1905 image uh, with the Dodd House, which I'll talk more about here. And today it's the railroad, a rail yard restaurant. And we can continue our trip, walk a block southward to the corner of Gillette Avenue and 2nd Street, or in 1905, the corner of Gillette Avenue and Angus Street. Again, the names got changed. So looking southward again, and in the 1904-1905 image, you can see that ridge line, modern day, that's where Twin Spruce uh, Middle School is, and Mount Pisgah Cemetery. And we know modern day, behind that ridge is Interstate 90, and the area where Walmart is, and a whole heck more of Gillette. Back then, this pretty much was the town. Gillette had a population of about 200. So it's changed quite a bit in the last 120 so years. And we can continue on to the corner of Gillette Avenue and 3rd Street, or, uh, or Auburn Street. Ah. So Auburn Street back in 1905. And in that corner is the Osler Saddle Shop, which he opened that saddle shop in January 1905. We just found that out this morning. Nothing like waiting to the last minute to do your research. And that is where Ali Means, we think, bought this saddle in 1905. Some debate on that, but this would be the saddle Ali Means purchased when he got to Wyoming, we're thinking. So talking more about why the heck does Gillette even exist? Back in 1891, railroad came through here. So Gillette is on the railroad. It's a cow town on the railroad, like many of the railroad towns. Gillette's where the cowboys would have brought the cattle to put on the train to ship it back east. And so ranches as far away as Biddle, Montana, would have brought their cattle on into Gillette, which comes into a point in our story. So Ali Means shot. So since this is a presentation with the state archives, I'm going to talk a little bit about the sources I use, such as newspapers. So here we have the 1905 uh, 
front page cover of the Gillette News. And in it, in addition to the Alley Means being shot story, we have this cool political cartoon, which is why I cropped it out, because it raises questions of what the heck is going on here. And this is a political cartoon, because in the wider world, at this time, we have the Russo-Japanese War, Russia and Japan are at it, and we have the uh, Portsmouth Peace Talks being led by everybody's favorite 20th century president, Theodore Roosevelt. So Roosevelt ended up winning the Nobel Peace Prize for that. And so we have this political cartoon where the cartoonist clearly is thinking Japan's getting a better deal out of the peace talks, kind of its own story, but you can go down the historical rabbit hole uh, looking at all these historic newspapers. But we're more interested in the local story of Ali Means. So, continuing on talking about newspapers and as historical sources, newspapers have problems. Just like today, they're in a race to get the news out as quickly as possible. Sometimes they may or may not be factually accurate. So, they're reporting that Noah Richardson and Ali Means were boyhood chums. Were they really? So, digging deeper, we find out. Um, through doing historical research that Ali Means grew up in San Antonio, Texas. Noah Richardson grew up in South Carolina, Anderson, South Carolina. So from that, probably didn't know each other as boys. How did they meet? Well, Noah Richardson left South Carolina in his early 20s and went to Texas, to San Antonio. That's likely where he met Ali Means, and they came up together as cowboys driving cattle northward to Wyoming. And they were in Wyoming for about a year, and in 1905, the Cowboys had a, got to Gillette, had a get-together. And so at this uh, get-together, Noah Richardson, he brought a lady friend by the name of Francis Williams. So this is where our story really takes off. So Noah Richardson, he brings a lady friend, Francis Williams, whom the newspapers, they said she's a lady of ill repute. I'll just leave that to your imagination to keep this family friendly. So Noah Richardson brings Francis Williams to the party. Problem is Francis Williams and Allie Means hit it off and begin flirting with one another. Other cowboys at the party reported that they had to break the two apart, Noah Richardson and Allie Means, break them apart physically from fighting. So Noah Richardson is not too happy that Allie Means is flirting with uh, he perceives as his girl. He and the, later on said that he, quote, won Francis Williams. So it gives you some idea of the um, gender stereotypes of the time. But Noah Richardson is not too pleased that Ali Means is flirting with his woman. And so, but when it comes time to leave the party, Francis Williams elects to go home with Ali Means. And this infuriates Richardson to the point where he follows them to Burlington Lake, just north of town. Nowadays, it's kind of part of town. There's a bike path there, a nice dog park. But back then, it was on the edge of town, across the railroad tracks. And so Noah Richardson follows Allie Means and Francis Williams there. And Richardson fires four shots at Allie Means, three of which hitting Means. Means does not die immediately. He is able to spur his horse onward and make it across the tracks into Gillette, where he goes into the Buffalo Hump Saloon. So Buffalo Hump, it's now Montgomery's uh, bar. And back then, it was Montgomery's Buffalo Hump because there was a buffalo painted on the door. So a good way to name it. And we can see in the historical photo, it is the darker colored building on the corner. That building was torn down in 1911, rebuilt um, as a new building that caught fire in the 1940s. And so the modern day Montgomery's Bar is the third iteration of this building, which is why I had so much trouble lining those photos up for this um, video. But then next to it, we have the Daily Store, which was one of the first stores in Gillette, opened two days before the railroad made it to Gillette. So Alley Means, a bleeding Alley Means, he goes into the Buffalo Hump, and we have the uh, historical photo. Yes, I did count the stars on the flag, and there's 46 of them. So that dates it to 1907, 1911 time frame before Nevada joined the Union. So one good way to date photos. Um, so this photo, a bleeding alley means would have gone into this bar and collapsed on one of these tables calling for a doctor. So different kind of doctor. But he was collapsed on the table calling for a doctor, and the doctor in Gillette at that time was Dr. Norval Baker. Dr. Baker initially came to Wyoming with the railroad to Sundance, 
and then ended up coming to Gillette. Um, one of my coworkers just told me that she had researched that Dr. Baker would often go to hot springs to seek treatment for his opioid um, addiction. So get to know about your doctor. Uh, and later he went on to Sheridan. So he's the doctor in Gillette. His office was just a few um, stores, a few buildings down from the Buffalo Hump. So he was able to get there quickly. And he quickly uh, diagnosed means with three bullet holes in him and said that it was beyond his treatment. And he recommended means be shipped to Sheridan for more advanced medical treatment. And so Means is put on the next train to Sheridan, and he ends up making it to Sheridan, but then dies that following Monday. Uh, the shooting took place on a Saturday, and Means succumbs to his wounds by that Monday. Uh, the doctor in Sheridan was Dr. Levers. And another interesting thing is that the good people of Gillette at the time, they were able to raise $165 to help uh, Allie Means with the transportation costs and the doctor bills. Um, which would about been about uh, $5,500 today. So quite a significant sum, sum of money Smart Town Gillette was able to raise for him. So back to the shooting. So Richardson's perspective, he shoots Means. He sees Means uh, head off into Gillette, and he follows in hot pursuit. He watches Means go into the Buffalo Hump, Richardson, he goes across the street, across Gillette Avenue, into what was then the Dodd House in Tufts Salon. So the Dodd House, built in 1902 by Al Dodd, and interesting to note that about two months after the shooting, Sam Goings purchases the property, and that becomes the Goings Hotel, which is a huge staple here in Gillette. Our museum has the Goings front desk out as our front desk now, for observing that history. So Sam uh, Goings purchases the property, just about two months after the shooting. But during the shooting, Noah Richardson goes into the Dodd house, demands of the barkeeper, the barkeeper's gun, and he is subdued by a guy named Brett Frazier. I wish I could find more information about this, how they subdued him, but all I could find is in the papers that they subdued him, and they were able to get Deputy Sheriff Eugene to arrest Richardson. And so, uh, yeah, we have historical photos of the going hotel as well. So Deputy Sheriff Lou Jean, he arrests Richardson, and he takes him to Sundance. Why would he take him to Sundance? Because in 1905, Gillette, Campbell County hadn't bothered to exist yet. Campbell County didn't come into existence until 1911, so Sundance is still the county seat. So they take uh, Richardson to jail in Sundance, same jail that the Sundance kid would have been years earlier. Um, and so Deputy Sheriff, he gives his sworn testimony that Richardson did willfully, maliciously, unlawfully, villainously, purposefully, and with premeditated malice, kill and murder said Ali Means. So I love the use of the language there. It's very colorful. So, turns out Ali Means has family. So just out of curiosity, show of hands, who here is related to the Means family? We've got quite a few actually, yeah. So Allie Means, he had family down in Texas. Uh, Allie Means' his father, John Means, and two of his brothers, B.B. Means and Warren Means, they come up to Gillette. Legend is, family lore, is that they come to kill Richardson and find Richardson already in jail. So, but the newspapers, all I could really find is that they're out here looking after the prosecution of Richardson, which tell on the newspapers that you're here to kill the murder of your brother probably not something you tell the newspapers. So you couldn't find that specifically in the historical record, but the family lore seems to be that he came up, they came up to kill Richardson and ended up liking Gillette because they brought the rest of the family up here, including Monty Means, who at the time of the murder would have been about 10 years old. Well, the next slide I got for you is kind of a cool slide because the Rockpile Museum, we recently came into a collection of historical uh, photographic negatives and so uh, besides Greg Bennett, one of our volunteers who processed them, and myself, uh, most people, I don't think anybody's seen the next photographs in over 100 years. And we have two, three photographs of the Means brothers, uh, B.B. Worry and Monty Means. So kind of, you guys are pretty much the first people to see these photos in 100 years, which is, I think is cool. Uh, and Monty Means, he grows up in Gillette in 1917, so just after this photo was taken, ends up joining the army, 
because you have World War One going on. And so he serves in the army in World War One for two years and then ends up coming back to July. And marrying and having a family, and I mean, that's probably who most of the means is here are related to. So back to Richardson, he is in jail in Sundance and put on trial for murder. And he is convicted in June 1906 of first degree premeditated murder, which carries with it the death penalty. And he is then shipped from Sundance down to the state penitentiary in Rawlings. And so at his trial, a list of witnesses. So shout out, I don't know if she's watching, but Joanne Innsmore means was able to provide some of the resources, including this list of the witnesses. Um, and some of the witnesses, we have our girl, Frances Williams. She was a, apparently paid 20 bucks to give her testimony. Uh, we also have Dr. Baker, and, who was the doctor in Gillette who initially treated uh, Means, and Dr. Levers, the doctor in Sheridan who treated him. And then we have a photograph in our collection of um, W.R. Fox, who was the coroner of Sundance and Gillette at the time, and two photographs of Sam Dido. Um, the first one, photograph here in front of the Daily Store, and then the darker colored building would have been the Buffalo Hump where Means collapsed. And the second photo is a T7 Ranch Roundup, and the um, newspapers reported Means had worked at the T7, so that's probably how Sam and Means knew each other. So Richardson is sent to Rollins to the state penitentiary, and in the historical uh, accounts, there is some confusion about the status of Richardson. Uh, the warden is writing the Wyoming um, Attorney General, what the heck do we do with this guy? Which kind of confused me, you think the state pen would know what to do. <laughs> but according to this website I found, uh, it turns out that, spoiler alert, Richardson was not ultimately executed. Had he been executed, he would have been the first person, first inmate in the New Orleans Penitentiary to uh, face the death penalty. So that's why there was some confusion. Uh, previously, you had the territorial prison in Laramie, and the state pen in Rollins was only built uh, in receiving inmates in 1901. And so there had not been an actual execution there yet. And before that, the last execution had taken place in the county where the trial was, which was uh, Tom Horn down in Cheyenne. And you may have noticed Tom Horn, I'm Justin Horn. I can report that I am without a doubt not related to Tom Horn. <laughs> But there's a whole story there, another presentation. But so uh, Richardson, had he been executed, he would have been the first person. So that's why there was so much confusion between the warden as to is Richardson in the general population? How do we treat death row inmates? But ultimately, they didn't have to decide because Richardson, he, um, he wanted a second trial. So he got an, uh, an appeal. And so there was a second trial in Sundance in 1907, and this time Richardson, he is found guilty of second degree murder, second degree manslaughter, which carries with it a term, he got life in prison. So his sentence was reduced to life in prison, for which he was reportedly overjoyed. Understandably, I would assume. So now he is sentenced to life in prison and sent back to Rollins to the state penitentiary to live out the rest of his natural life. And the way he got uh, his lawyers got his sentence reduced was they argued insanity or as the papers reported he had a brainstorm or a mental cyclone Again, I love the language <laughs> so he got his sentence reduced because they argued he was insane I really wasn't expecting that slide <laughs> so Richardson is sent back to Rollins to live out the rest of his days in the state pen and we fast forward about six years to the largest prison break in Wyoming history. So there's apparently overcrowding and conditions are extremely harsh down in the state pen in Rollins, which if you get a chance today at the historical site, they give tours. I Last time I went was in high school, so it was really cool, you need to go back. And you can kind of, having seen it, kind of see why things were so harsh, not a pleasant place to be. So the inmates, they're getting the places um, a powder keg ready to explode. The inmates in July 1912, they set fire to the broom factory. There's a broom factory for the inmates to work at, and they set fire to it in protest. Then things continue to escalate in October of 1912, 
there's a lynching in the prison. Uh, the inmates lynch a fellow inmate, a black man by the name of Frank Wingfall, who was in there accused of raping a white woman. So now you're adding the racial tensions to it. And so the state pen is just a powder keg ready to go off. And it goes off on October 12, 1912, where there is um, one of the inmates, Brett Dalton. He leads a group of 20 or 19 other inmates in the largest prison break in Wyoming history. They overpower the guards and make their way through the fence. Then the next day, Richardson and seven other inmates, while all the warden and other guards are out looking for the escapees, they overpower one of the remaining guards, take his keys, and now having the keys for the prison, are able to get many of the prison's guns and make their way out of the prison. So prison break over two days. So as you can imagine, Rollins, people in Rollins are on a state of high alert. There's been two massive prison breaks. Uh, one of the accounts I read in the Rollins newspaper was that one of the guys, a guy, citizen of Rollins, was going to go out to water the livestock, and his wife tells him to be careful, and he kind of plays it off, joking, there's nothing to worry about. Oh, I'll take my gun just in case, kind of mocking his wife. And, well, it turns out it was a good thing he does because he gets into the barn, and there's a whole group of um, escaped convicts in there. And because he's able to have his gun with him, he's able to help recapture those inmates. Another citizen of Rollins on high alert was Charles Stressener. Stressener was the barber down in Rollins. And so he sees a group of men running through his yard. He assumes that they're escaped convicts. So he goes out to confront them with what the newspaper said was an unloaded gun. So maybe not the wisest thing to do. Um, and unfortunately for Stressener, Noah Richardson, who has one of the prison guns that he was able to steal with the keys, he sees Stressener with a gun, and he doesn't hesitate and opens fire, hitting Stressener in the head and killing him instantly. So now Richardson's committed the second murder in his life. So now this group of Richardson and the seven other inmates, they're on the run. They're making their way south of Rollins, um, across the railroad tracks. The guards from the prison are um, forming a posse heading after them, and they get into a firefight on the south side of Rollins. Uh, the prison, uh, the guards are able to apprehend, uh, it would have been four of the inmates, leaving only three, um, and they're able to, and they wound one of the remaining three in the process. So the remaining three are Richardson, Backstrom, and Burke, and they wound uh, Burke in the process of escaping, but these three are now on the lamp headed south of Rollins. So they're on the lamp south of Rollins for two weeks. Uh, heading from Rollins, they're trying to get to Colorado. And so after two weeks on the lam, the police, they're looking for them. And on November 1st, they find the body of Burke. The official story is that Richardson and Backstrom killed him, but there's dispute as to why. So Burke had been wounded in that um, shootout escape in Rollins. Their speculation was there a dispute in leadership amongst the three? Was Burke wounded and slowing them down? or was Burke wounded and didn't want to be recaptured, so they killed him out of mercy instead of him being captured. It's a little unclear as to why, but Richardson and Backstrom kill Burke. And another thing that happens is that it's November, it's starting to snow, so that makes um, it possible for the police to follow the tracks of Richardson and Backstrom now, and they follow them to a sheep wagon outside of Bags, Wyoming in Powder Wash, and they get into a Hollywood-style shootout with the two convicts now. And so, as the newspaper says, again, I love the language, Richardson stepped out of the wagon with a rifle in his hand and stood on the pose off until he dropped with several bullets in his body. Members of the posse state that Richardson showed every minute of the time that he was absolutely without fear and that he would meet certain death rather than surrender. In a fight, he stood out in plain sight of the four crack shots who were after him and offered himself as a target to get a better shot at some of his pursuers. Backstrom remained in the wagon where he kept up a steady fire at the posse before the deputies dared to approach the sheep wagon. They riddled it with bullets and Backstrom was hit four or five times and causing his death. So again, Hollywood style shootout would make a great movie. And so ends the uh, saga of Allie Means and Noah Richardson until I started working here at the museum about a year ago. 
and came across this saddle with uh, no real label on it and started doing some research and came across this amazing story. So there's quite a few of you high schoolers out here. So there's stories, I wanna leave you up, there's stories all around us. You just kind of gotta go looking because you never know what you're gonna turn up with. And I hope that uh, this talk kind of maybe inspired you and showed you some of the importance of history and museums. We have a whole section of our audience here today in Gillette, Wyoming, because long ago, one of their ancestors was murdered and that brought a whole family up here. So hopefully that brings some that this stuff actually matters. So I want to thank everyone for coming out. And we're going to try and do a Q&A with um, the audience in Cheyenne. I don't know technologically how this is going to go, gonna but if it. anybody's got any questions, feel free to stick around. So I guess they're going to type the questions down to Cheyenne. So while we're waiting on that, does anybody here have any questions? Yes, How did the age of the two men compare? Uh, Allie Means was about 24. Noah Richardson, I think, was 28 at the time of the moment. Oh, really? Uh, his mugshot was, would have been later. All on the count of a woman. Yep, all because of a woman. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> Where did they bury him? Uh, Alley Means was buried in Sheridan. That's another historical mystery. We haven't actually found a grave, but supposedly he's at the Sh uh, Sheridan Cemetery. And then I don't actually know on Richardson. I would assume at the penitentiary, but I don't actually know on that one. Yeah, the question is how do you find the newspapers? Uh, the Wyoming State Library has a website that they digitize a lot of them. It's Wyoming newspapers. Wyoming newspapers. What happened to the Williams lady? I would. What happened to the Williams lady? I would absolutely love to know. I couldn't find any more on her, but I would love to know. I'm just asking for Francis Williams. Oh, I know. Yeah. Well, that's why I cannot hear Cheyenne. How about now? Can you hear us now? Well, now I can't hear you. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll ask our question, sir. Can you can you ask the speak question? loud? Yeah. Was Ali Mead shot with a rifle or a pistol, and what caliber of gun was it? <laughs> was Ali Mead shot with a rifle, a pistol, or and what um, what caliber was the gun? Okay, 
I don't know what caliber a firearm is used. I'm assuming probably a pistol, but I don't actually know. The newspapers didn't say that. Um, the they, news, they don't know. The newspaper didn't say what kind of a uh, firearm it was. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any other questions? No? Oh, yes. How long did Richardson serve? We kind of lost that part of the program. Oh, yeah. So our Wi Fi cut out a little bit, so we didn't hear how long uh, Richardson ended up serving. Uh, in the pen. From, Richardson was there from in the state pen from 1906 to 1912, so six years. Susie, did he say six years? I'm asking. Was that six years? You you kind of cut out on us again. Sorry. Okay. Yes, six years. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? What was his biggest surprise in his research? What was your biggest surprise? The biggest surprise in my research is how little work has been done on the prison break. It seems like a huge historical event and almost nothing's been done with it. So that's something that needs more research and future paper, future presentation for people. Any more questions? How little was done on what? On the prison break. Prison break? Yeah. Oh. I think you, oh, one more question. Did he serve any time for the second murder? No. Was he, did Richardson serve any time for the second murder? Once again, we kind of cut out for that section. Richardson didn't serve any time because he was killed by the police while they were trying to apprehend him. <laughs> Sounds good, thank you. Any other, uh, any other questions here in Cheyenne? Nope, I think you have satisfied our curiosity. We'd love to hear more questions if you have any in July. All right, thank you, uh, State Archives in Cheyenne. Uh, we do have a question here. Were any of the people that were the guards, were they killed? Uh, I do, did not find any of the guards actually being killed. I think you took a subject that had very little information and made a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, State Archives, do you have any announcements or final closing remarks for us? On May 9th, we have Joe Ellis going to talk, um, talk about South Pass City. Who is the next State Archives evening speaker series? So the prison that you visited when you were in high school, it's not there anymore? It's there. It's done. It's just